Hey everybody, it's Will here. Welcome back to another episode of the Block Rare Intelligence YouTube channel. Uh, please excuse kind of my, my nasally sounding voice. I've been feeling uh, under the weather this week, but nonetheless, people need their on-chain uh, content. I'm here to deliver it to you guys. Um, so yeah, it's been a, another wild week in, in the Bitcoin world as always. Uh, volatility is back as, as we had kind of uh, been watching last week for this volatility squeeze. Uh, Let's go ahead and get into some of the on-chain trends that we've been following. <clears throat> so uh, because some of the key takeaways from this week, uh, first of all, we have a very substantial leverage wipeout um, for the market this week, liquidating approximately $1.23 billion of uh, leverage longs um, and also wiping out uh, roughly uh, $4.4 .4 billion of perpetual futures open interest. <clears throat> Uh, most of the selling this week, and especially on Tuesday, was done by younger coins. Uh, Long-term holders actually seem unfazed, and their, their holdings actually increased, and we'll get into this a bit more in detail in a minute. Whales have actually bought an additional 44,393 coins this week, which is roughly $2 billion, um, and including that an uptick on uh, Tuesday as well. So um, it's interesting, and, and once again, we'll, we'll get into this in a minute, but um, seeing an uptick in long-term holders, uh, you know, uh, coins, and then as well, whales holdings um, while you saw this leverage, uh, you know, wipe out. I think that's a very interesting dynamic to, to kind of keep an eye on uh, moving forward. Exchanges are down uh, another 25,733 Bitcoin this week, uh, which is roughly $1.18 billion in, in USD terms. Um, profitability has reset um, using some of our SOPR metrics. Um, and it has bounced back into a state of profit. Um, this is a reset that we've been watching for over the last couple of weeks. Uh, but to be honest, I, I didn't expect it to come this soon, but nonetheless, we've got it. Uh, and so far, I've had a positive reaction, which we'll get into. Uh, and then lastly, hash continues to come back on the network. Uh, minor profitability in Bitcoin terms is dropping and in USD terms is flat. Uh, and then miners have sold an additional 467 Bitcoin this week, um, which is roughly $21.2 million. So Tuesday was the largest uh, long liquidation cascade that the Bitcoin market has experienced since uh, May 19th. And so like what exactly happened? Um, so prior to the crash, we had futures open interest rising alongside an uptick in our estimated leverage ratio on Monday. Um, funding was also positive at the time, um, although it was kind of far from levels that we that we had reached earlier this year. <clears throat> These factors in the derivatives market gave like a really favorable setup for a leveraged uh, cleansing, right? Um, and although I must admit, like, I didn't see this coming, right, and, like the magnitude that, it, that we had a 20% move, um, you know, I, I think we were somewhat susceptible to this, right? Um, you know, one piece of information that I wasn't paying attention to that I will be moving forward um, are the spot margin lending rates. And this is something that uh, Willie actually pointed out to me. Uh, and so, you know, this, this is basically tracking like the demand to, to go leverage um, on spot. Um, and, and borrow, uh, you know, spot on margin. So this is something I'll be following, you know, moving forward. Um, you actually saw this spike pretty substantially right before the sell-off, um, which was another indication that, you know, we had a, a good amount of leverage in the system. Um, so like prior to the prior to the cascade, there were some coins that moved onto exchanges, which you'll see in this chart. Um, although it wasn't anything alarming, we didn't see like any like, instant, you know, just wave of coins move on. Uh, but you did see a spike right before uh, as you'll see in the chart. Um, and so like this could have been the the catalyst that kind of initiated it. I've also kind of anecdotally heard that a large um, OTC desk, so over-the-counter uh, desk sale was partially responsible for this. And perhaps they had to outsource some of the liquidity from exchanges. And so, um, you know, uh, they had to go to the open market and, and sell coins onto that uh, to fully, you know, get their client, uh, their, their seller recovered. Uh, but yeah, and I can't I can't see this in Glassnode's data because they only track um, this like six major uh, OTC desks. So there's there's definitely some that they aren't following there. Um, so yeah, as, as one uh, trader's forced liquidation sale triggered the next stop loss, uh, we got roughly one point two three billion dollars of longs liquidated, as we mentioned. Uh, Six hundred twenty two million dollars worth came from Bybit, which is uh, by far the, the most substantial. Um, and then in case you're wondering why the, the $1.23 billion uh, figure doesn't align with this chart here, it's just because uh, Glassnode only is using Binance, BitMEX, and OKX in this chart. Um, so I had to pull some, some data from like an external derivatives platform. 
So as we as we mentioned in total, uh, roughly four point four billion dollars of perpetual uh, futures open interest was wiped out, uh, and I personally view this as a healthy cleansing. So we were kind of getting to levels in terms of uh, per open interest that we were at, you know, earlier this year. Um, and you also see this in, in the futures uh, estimated leverage ratio. So this is just looking at, um, you know, open interest in comparison to the amount of coins on exchanges. Uh, and so this is kind of a good proxy for, for determining like how collateralized traders are in the market, right? And so you can see we had this complete wipeout on Tuesday. And then here's our funding rates. So uh, we touched on funding rates many times. This is the mechanism that pegs the perpetual swap to the index price, which is a weighted uh, average of all the, the major spot exchanges. Uh, and so what you'll see is that, um, you know, funding rates had spiked leading up to the cascade. And then following that, we actually got a dip into negative uh, funding. So that was the first time that we had a reset of, to negative funding uh, since early August. And so when you go back and look at strong bull trends, uh, you know, if we're in a bull market, which, uh, you know, some of the broader metrics suggest to me very strongly that we are, um, these traditionally have been very good buy the dip opportunities whenever funding goes negative. <clears throat> in total, the market absorbed uh, $262.5 million of net realized losses. Uh, and then very similar to what we just touched about, about negative funding. Uh, this is the first reset since uh, August 3rd. Uh, and so like since then, the market has now transitioned back into a state of net realizing profits. Another way to look at this is our SOPR metrics. Um, so we have three different metrics in the SOPR family here up on the screen. Uh, on the top, you'll see our A SOPR metric. Um, this is adjusted SOPR, so filtering out outputs under one hour to kind of filter out some noise. Uh, and then in the bottom left, you'll see our short-term holder SOPR. And then in the bottom right, you'll see our long-term holder SOPR. Uh, and so what you see is that a, you know, in, in, in the A SOPR, uh, no pun intended, um, we came back down and had a reset. And this is uh, our first reset and since I think um, early August as well. I have to go back and look at the chart. Um, but, you know, this is something that we had been watching for. And I remember in last, last week's newsletter, I put, you know, we, we could get a, a reset on the horizon. Um, it didn't mean that it necessarily had to come very soon. Um, but, you know, nonetheless, we did get that reset on Tuesday. And, and so, yeah, like, when you're, when you're in a broader bullish trend, uh, buying whatever SOPR dips down onto that neutral state of profitability and coming back and, and tapping one, uh, that's been a really good buy the dip opportunity traditionally. And then conversely, when you get into a bear market, uh, whenever SOPR comes back and tests one, um, that's been a good time to, to fade the rallies, right? Um, so you, know, you kind of have to look at, okay, what's the broader trend? Then once you have, you know, once you feel confident about what you think that broader trend is, then you can zoom in and use some of these, um, some of these metrics to kind of get some timing and kind of pick your spots. But nonetheless, um, you know, I think this was, this was a healthy reset, um, given that, you know, some of the broader metrics are showing that we're in a bullish uptrend. Uh, but yeah, sober um, in terms of, in, in terms of short-term holders, uh, actually dipped pretty substantially <clears throat> below one, while our long-term holder metric didn't tap one, but we did get a drawdown in that. Uh, but all three have, as you can see, have, have had a pretty nice rebound since. And then on a similar note, uh, when we're trying to like identify who is responsible for the majority of the selling, um, what we have here is our spent volume age bands. So um, I put in the newsletter several times the spent output age bands, and, and this is a little different because this is just looking at the volume um, of all spent outputs on any given day um, versus uh, the spent output age bands. It's just looking at the number of outputs. Um, and so what you'll see here is that, oh God, my voice just cracked really bad right there. Um, what, what you'll see is um, a huge spike in terms of uh, the, the you know, shorter term cohorts. So when you look at one hour to 24 hour, one day to one week, and then one week to one month, um, and all these younger cohorts, you saw a big spike while well, long-term holders uh, and the portion of, of supply that they were selling onto the market actually dropped on Tuesday. Um, so you had this effect where short-term holders were selling while well, long-term holders were sitting tight. <clears throat> and so now we'll transition to, you know, has this event had any like broader effects on the market um, and like the, kind of the underlying market structure that we've been tracking? Um, and the answer is no. In fact, these accumulation trends have only uh, actually strengthened this week, including on Tuesday. Uh, exchanges are down another 25,733 BTC this week, which is reflected by, um, as you'll see, this, this purple line. This is our exchange supply shock metric. So this is just com uh, comparing the amount of coins that are on exchanges 
uh, relative to the amount of coins that aren't on exchanges and aren't available to be, I mean, that are available to be, um, to be bought relative to the amount of coins that aren't available to be bought. Uh, and so, yeah, we, we, we've just completely retraced <clears throat> this week um, from, from the, the peak that we were at um, in May. Uh, so yeah, this is, this is showing really strong accumulation, right? Um, and then also here we have the, our blue, uh, which is our, our liquid supply shock ratio. Um, this is, I think I put this in the newsletter every week. This is uh, the ratio I created with Willie back in like early uh, July. This is tracking the movement of coins from weak to strong hands. Um, and so you actually saw an uptick in this on Tuesday and then just in general in this week as well. Um, and that, that's in, you know, in, uh, coinciding with, with the uh, uptick in the exchange supply shock ratio. And then you'll see in, in the red, <clears throat> this is the highly liquid ratio. So this is tracking the movement of coins. So we have you know, highly liquid, liquid, and then illiquid. Um, and so this is tracking the movement of coins from highly liquid uh, to liquid entities. So this is, uh, as I like kind of think of a way to think of it, like, um, I, I hope we can edit that out. That wasn't a really great uh, wording there. But I like to think of this as a proxy for short-term holders, right? From um, the coins moving from, uh, you know, speculators that are in and out of the market all day um, to these short-term uh, investors. But I would like to see that, you know, translate into a liquid supply, but we'll see over the next week or two. And then in addition, we actually saw whales increase their holdings once again. Uh, so this metric on the screen takes all entities. So these are you know, forensically clustered addresses. Uh, and then um, <clears throat> looks at the entities that have over 1000 Bitcoin and then filters out all the uh, known entities that, that we've identified on chain. So, you know, Grayscale, uh, the Purpose ETF, QBTC, and then most importantly, um, exchanges. And so this is important because, um, you know, if you haven't filtered out for exchanges, let's say, uh, you know, a bunch of coins move on to exchanges, which is uh, a bearish thing, right? But if you haven't filtered out for those exchanges, you'll see an uptick in what appears to be whale holdings, which you would presume to be a bullish thing, but it's really not, right? Um, so by filtering out those exchanges, you get the raw whale balance, as I like to, as I like to kind of put it. Um, and so this week, whales have added 44,393 Bitcoin, which is roughly $2 billion this week. And you'll see we've fully retraced um, as well, uh, fully retraced from the point that we kind of peaked at um, earlier this year in, in mid-April. So whales are back, everybody. <clears throat> and so it's easy to get concerned with these short-term moves, but you know I think it's important to remember the broader picture is highly bullish. Um, here we have our like short-term, uh, long-term holder supply. Uh, I'll edit that out. It's easy to get concerned by these short-term moves, but I think it's important to remember the broader picture is highly bullish. Here we have our long-term holder supply shock ratio, which compares the uh, holdings of long-term holders to short-term holders. And what we see is that the ratio is now uh, approaching a zone that historically has caused a supply shock effect on the market, as you'll see with this green line. Uh, and so we just have entered this highlighted green zone, which um, is, is what I'm referring to here by this historical zone that's initiated a supply shock. And so I'm suspecting you know, if, if we continue to, uh, you know, follow this trend, we'll probably reach the upper bands of this within the next month or two. Uh, and so, yeah, the amount of non like nominal Bitcoin term uh, supply that, that um, long term holders possess has reached another all time high this week, um, increased by 83,062 coins, which is roughly three point eight two billion dollars. Um, and this doesn't necessarily mean that long term holders bought that amount this week. Uh, probably a fair portion of that is actually um, long-term holders, or I mean, short-term holders aging into that long-term holder band and aging past that 155-day threshold, right? Um, and we can also see that in our realized, uh, our realized HODL waves. Um, you can see really strong maturation of coins. <clears throat> so investors that came in the market earlier this year are now starting to um, hold those coins and age into what we recognize as the long-term holder uh, threshold, right? And then lastly, we just take a peek at what miners are doing. So hash continues to come back on the network, showing no real signs of slowing down. Uh, at the same time, um, you know, more competition for the same block reward coming online. Uh, minor revenue in Bitcoin uh, term in Bitcoin per hash has dropped. Uh, so revenue per hash in Bitcoin terms has dropped. Um, however, when denominating this in USD terms, um, the revenue looks much stronger. So you'll see in this in this chart here. Uh, the light blue line is, is uh, revenue per hash in uh, BTC terms, uh, and blue is in USD terms. Um, and this orange line is hash rate, 
And then uh, the green is actually minor balances. So what you'll see is that as hash comes back on the network, so more competition for the same block reward, um, the, um, the revenue in, in, in BTC terms has gone down, right? Because there's more competition. Uh, but then at the same time, you have Bitcoin price going up. So then you'll, you, you see this uh, dark blue line. This has actually been increasing as Bitcoin's price has been increasing, but then it's been kind of flat over the last week or two. Um, and then what you see is that miners have actually been selling over the last two weeks. Um, nothing, you know, very substantial. Uh, they sold an additional 467 Bitcoin this week, according to Glassnode, um, which is, I put this earlier, I don't know the number off the top of my head, uh, roughly $21 million of BTC. So, you know, uh, this is kind of a trend we'll have to keep an eye on, um, but you know, I, I just think it's probably just miners taking profits in combination with, um, you know, as hash comes back on the network, they have to sell a couple coins, you know, to cover their opex. So, I don't see anything like you know, very concerning here, but just you know, something to, to keep an eye on. And I also just like following what miners are doing in general. Um, so yeah, and that's all I got for this week, guys. And then as you know, as you'll see in the bottom portion of the newsletter, we also have a Bitcoin related equities write up. Uh, done by my buddy, Blake Davis. Um, he always does a really good job, but I just don't want to speak for him. Uh, but yeah, he, he'll cover all the technicals for some of the main, uh, you know, equities that, that perhaps you'll be interested in. So that's all I got for this week, guys. Um, hopefully next week, my voice isn't cracking and I don't sound like a horse. Um, but yeah, looking forward to chatting next week, guys. And uh, I hope you have a great weekend. Take care. Bye.